Shalom, everyone. In the Nazarim, that's what we're called. There's something for the masses to see, and then there's something for the initiated to see. It's the darkness hiding in open view. We call them Wiccans, witches, warlocks, wizards, shamans. That's what they go by. It's poison doctrine. Hello, my name is Lou White, and I'm here today to invite you uh, to listen to a topic that involves the inhabitation of a spirit, you know, in ourselves. And uh, we remember Yahushua's words in Matthew Yahu chapter 24, that's Matthew chapter 24. His disciples ask him what would be the sign of his coming. And we all see these things around us all the time, you know, the things that are happening in the world, you know, the nations, nationalities are rising against nationalities and kingdoms, reigns against reigns, kingdom against kingdom. But uh, he also said something else that pertained to the days of Noah. That in the days of Noah, there was nothing on the heart of men other than violence continually. And something happened in the news this week. Um, there's a new thing that's going on, a new scourge of drugs that have been passing through the uh, world. And especially here in the United States, we saw it four years ago appearing around the military installations. And then it started to grow in popularity and everybody was looking for it in these little smoke shops and um, gas stations and liquor stores, a lot, a lot of times manned by foreigners. And they would sell these little jars, uh, like one gram uh, or so, of a substance that would spray with an acid. And it goes by literally dozens or even hundreds of names, but it causes uh, the body temperature to rise and people to hallucinate. And it's, uh, it goes by the name bath salts. It goes by the name kratom, salvia, legal herb. People smoke it and, or they, they snort it. Um, and it causes permanent nerve damage to the human nervous system. It's not for human consumption, but people still use it. And in the, this week's news, there was a man who reminded me of the days of Noah. A 30-something-year-old man attacked a mid-60s-year-old man, a homeless man. And the man that was the attacker apparently was on some of the substance, this uh, legal herb, this bath salts material. And it makes the person real hot. And uh, I believe it was in Florida. Anyway, he stripped all of his clothes off. He's naked. It's happened in other cases, too, naked people attacking people. But in this particular case, for some 30 minutes, this naked man who was on this substance was attacking this older man and uh, had uh, eaten 80% of his face, his nose, his eyes, his mouth. He needs a face transplant now. He's still alive. But this reminded me of the days of Noah and a sign uh, that Yahushua is near. And uh, we can think of that kind of situation as from a zombie movie or something, you know, the violence. But it really is pointing back to Yahushua's statement about the signs of his coming, the violence upon the earth, would remind us of those days when people would literally eat one another you know, anyway, they were attacking one another and eating each other. The Nephilim would attack people, and people were attacking one another. Violence was just, and they were possessed by the fallen, the fallen ones. That's what Nephilim means. The Nephilim means the fallen ones. Anyway, the, the thing that I'm going to discuss today is not so much focused on that. Yeah, what I'm going to talk about, I'm going to introduce a couple of new words to you that you may have heard parts of before and been mystified by them, but the word paracleta is on the screen here. You can see it. Paracleta is an Aramaic word, and it went into the Greek, paraclete, and it means someone who comes alongside and supports and intercedes, and to come alongside and become an intercessor or a helper. And that, of course, we know is in the scriptures referring to the spirit of Yahushua who comes up alongside of us. In other words, he's choosing sides. We're not choosing sides. He is. He's chosen us as to be on his side. That's what Paracleta 
uh, refers to, and he is our mediator, our intercessor. Anyway, the paracleta, when he's present in a person, it's easy, easily, easily recognized. The person, you've probably seen people in your past from years ago that you remember had a difference about them. There was someone in them that was different. The person themselves inhabits their body, their house. But when a, a, an evil spirit comes in, it's dominating the strong man in that house and overcoming that strong man and pushing him aside. Well, in our case, what we have to do is submit to the Ruach HaKadosh, which is the set-apart spirit of Messiah, who comes into us, the Mashiach, literally comes into us, and we invite him into our house. He knocks, we open, and we invite him in. And that's what Yahushua is talking about. And when he said, this is my body, take and eat, that was a picture of us taking him into us. That's not what it was really about, literally, that was figurative. But that's the same thing. Now, we're guardians of his name and his word, and we obey from the heart because we love him, and therefore he enables us to receive his spirit. Acts 5.32 says basically the same thing, that the Ruach HaKodesh is given to those who obey him. So we willingly invite him in. We don't invite demons in willingly. Uh, maybe some do, but in this particular case where that man took those drugs, he was taking something into his body and it caused a change and it made him vulnerable and he was overcome. Now we're to be completely captured by Yahushua's love. That's what his goal is. And to be filled with light, the oil. In Hebrew, a lot of times the word oil is not referring to the physical oil. It's referring to the light that comes from the oil, you know. And uh, we're going to see a little bit more about that too. Today's seminar, we're going to quickly run through the list here. We're replacing the, the new traditional words that have happened by men's traditions with the original words. And this is going to restore quite a bit. The word L-O-R-D, or Lord, translates from the Hebrew word B-A-A-L. We certainly wouldn't want to have anything to do with that. So we call him by his name that they replaced Yahuwah, yod Hey uah Hey, four letters. And the name of the Messiah is not the horse or Je Jesus. It's actually Yahusha, means Yah is our deliverer. And it's Yahushua as well, and Yeshua in one place, Nehemiah 8. But all three are, forms are acceptable. This one happens to have been used 216 times in the Tanakh. That's the Old Testament, according to the, the, the Catholic uh, Christians. And we don't need the Greek when we have the original Hebrew, so we're going to use the word Mashiach. And sometimes you'll hear us use the word Messiah in the translation because that's what the translator used. But it um, basically means anointed one. And uh, the word G-O-D, we wouldn't use the name of a Norse deity's proper name. We would use the, that was supplanted and adopted. But this is the original Hebrew El or Elohim, meaning strength or my, my mighty one or strong one. And the tribe of the Yahudim is the original descendants of the man, Yehuda, which is one tribe. The rest of the tribes have other names and other fathers. And we, uh, we wouldn't refer to them as Jews because that's uh, something that was, a, you know, a, a distortion. So uh, we're not going to call ourselves by the title Christians or Christianos, but, which was a term of scorn. Three, it was only used three times in the text. But we were called Nazarim, according to Acts 24, verse 5. Yisrael would include all those descended from Jacob, but it would also include those who were not descended who have faith. And they're equal fellow, they're, they have uh, equal fellowship living in the covenant. They have to be living in the covenant before they can be, you know, Israel. Though even natural born Israelites that don't live by the covenant are, are cast out. So the Nazarim, uh, are, it's a Hebrew word that literally means guardians or watchmen. And what we are also is branches, which, as in the descendants of the teachings of Yahushua HaMashiach. He's the root, and we are the branches. And we get our life from the root. Now, here's the, uh, 
idea of the Nazarene being possessed, the first Nazarene that were possessed by the Ruach HaKodesh, the spirit of the Messiah, uh, Yehusha, were uh, controlled, occupied, or retained for use at Acts chapter 2. That was the very first time that we were corporately inhabited. It wasn't a birthday, though. It was a wedding celebration. The wedding was at Sinai, and we said we would obey our husband. He is our husband, and that was a marriage, and this is a marriage anniversary. The purpose or goal of this inhabitation of the Spirit, this possession, is the receiving of the mind of the Spirit, and it enables us to love the commandments by means of his indwelling, the Spirit of Yahushua HaMashiach. Now, let's look at a couple of evidences right off the bat. Acts 20 says, therefore, he's, uh, this is Paul talking to an assembly of elders. Therefore, take heed to yourselves and to all the flock, among which the set-apart spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the assembly of Elohim, which he has purchased with his own blood. Now, he bought us. So he has a legitimate stake in us. He owns us. Now, a demon that comes into a person's house would not have any claim to the property he's taken over. He did not buy that person. He took it by force. But we willingly give ourselves to him because he paid a great price for us. In 1 Corinthians 6, starting at verse 19, it says, Or do you not know that your body is the dwelling place of the set-apart spirit who is in you, which you have from Elohim, and you are not your own. You gave yourself up. For you were bought with a price. Therefore, esteem Elohim in your body and in your spirit, which are of Elohim. And this is a, a new... We, last week or so, uh, our banner under our sign, a little banner that was printed on both sides, was stolen. And the banner said, love one another. That's all it said. Love one another. Someone took a razor or a knife and sawed off the ropes and took it. Now we have to buy a new one. And this is my proposal that we have a new one. It doesn't look like this. I don't have a picture of it, but I just gave it to David. And uh, it says, love me and keep my commandments. That's the plan for the new banner. Maybe somebody will steal that too. That would be amazing. <laughs> Anyway, that, that's written, love me and keep my commandments verbatim, is written at Exodus 20, verse 6, and Deuteronomy 5, verse 10. It's also written at Yahukonet, or John chapter 14, and we'll see it here in, beginning at verse 18. I shall not leave you, orphans. I am coming to you. Yet a little while, and the world no longer sees me, but you shall see me, because I live and you shall live. In that day you shall know that I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. He who possesses my commands and guards them, it is he who loves me. And he who loves me shall be loved by my Father, and I shall love him and manifest myself to him. Now to, to know his commandments is the first step. Let's look at those. This is the restoration. This is given to us in Deuteronomy. And in chapter 4, 5, and 6, those three chapters, we see the whole plan. We were to be disobedient and scattered. And then in the last days, he would have these words right here, come upon us. And where we are, we would stop and repent and obey his commandments. Here's the retelling of the, of the covenant for the scattered tribes of Israel in the last days, given at Deuteronomy 5. Number one, I am Yahuwah, your Elohim who brought you out of the land of Mitzrayim, out of the house of bondage, you have no other mighty ones against my face. Number two, you do not make for yourself a carved image, any likeness of which is in the heavens above or which is in the earth beneath or which is in the waters under the earth. You do not bow down to them nor serve them. For I, Yahuwah, your Elohim, am a jealous El, visiting the crookedness of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing kindness to thousands, to those who love me and guard my commandments. Number three, you do not cast the name of Yahuwah, your Elohim, to ruin, for Yahuwah does not leave him unpunished who casts his name to ruin. Now the word cast is the Hebrew word nasa. That means to throw something. And 
the word ruin comes directly from the word shoah, which means to lay waste. The fourth commandment is the sign of the everlasting covenant. Everlasting. Guard the Sabbath, Sabbath day to set it apart. That's the Sabbath day. As Yahuwah your Elohim commanded you, six days you labor and shall do all your work, but the seventh day, that's the seventh day, is the Sabbath of Yahuwah your Elohim. You do not do any work. You nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your male servant, nor your female servant, nor your ox, nor your donkey, nor any of your cattle, nor your stranger who is within your gates, so that your male servant and your female servant rest as you do. And you shall remember that you were a slave in the land of Mitzrayim, and that Yahuwah your Elohim brought you out from there by a strong hand and by an outstretched arm. Therefore, Yahuwah your Elohim commanded you to observe the Sabbath day. Reading as Ezekiel chapter 20, you'll see that it is an everlasting covenant and a sign between Yahuwah and his people. Now, let's look quickly, after we read this commandment, let's look at Acts 1 verse 12. Sabbath day, Acts 1 verse 12. Then they went back to Jerusalem after they saw him ascend. From the Mount of Olives, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey. Now that's interesting. Number five, respect your father and your mother as Yahuwah your Elohim has commanded you so that your days are prolonged and so that it is well with you on the soil which Yahuwah your Elohim is giving you. Number six, you do not murder. Number seven, you do not break wedlock. Number eight, you do not steal. Number nine, you do not bear false witness against your neighbor. And number 10, you do not covet your neighbor's wife, nor do you desire your neighbor's house, his field, nor his male servant, nor his female servant, his ox, nor his donkey, or whatever belongs to your neighbor. And continuing on into the next chapter, hear, O Yisrael, Yahuwah our Elohim. Yahuwah is one. And you shall love Yahuwah your Elohim with all your heart and with all your being and with all your might. And these words, which I am commanding you today, shall be in your heart. And you shall impress them upon your children and shall speak of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise up and shall bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. And you shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates so that everyone will know you're a legalist and you are possessed. <laughs> now the paracleta. It's an Aramaic dialect of Hebrew, and it means intercessor, but it also refers to comforter, advocate, someone who comes up alongside and, or chooses sides, you know, like, hey, he's on my side, you know, a counselor, an encourager, or a helper. And in Yahukanan, <clears throat> chapter 14, at verse 16, we see Paracleta used, it refers to the spirit of Yahusha, coming back to his followers after he ascended to the Father, after his work of intercessor, now this is what he's doing now, he's an intercessor, but he will bring gifts. That's his next thing, that's the next thing he's gonna do. And we are the offering, the gifts that are, are gonna be made to the Father, Yahuwah, because guess what? Israel is his inheritance. It's not the circus, it's not the people who uh, keep Sunday, that's a, that's a man-made religion. That's a, that is a religion. It's not about religion. It's about the covenant, the marriage, you know, and the possession that we are. Anyway, we're going to be his, uh, his inheritance. Now, this is an interesting thing because the first king of Israel, which uh, the people demanded, was anointed king over Yahuwah's inheritance. In 1 Samuel 10, starting at verse 6, it says, And the spirit of Yahuwah, now this is Shemuel or Samuel talking to Shaul, the spirit of Yahuwah will come upon you, and you shall prophesy with them and be turned into another man. That's interesting. And it shall be, when these signs come to you, do for yourself as your hand finds to do, for Elohim is with you. That's amazing. Now, the purpose of that and now was to be used as a vessel of honor. See, some vessels are not used as vessels of honor. They're actually created in order to be destroyed. And that's his sovereignty. 
Others are used as, as vessels of honor. And if he chooses who he chooses, that's it. You know, the anointing of Yahuwah's spirit is, the sign of it is the presence of his spirit. And uh, it means to call to the side. That's what the Greek form of the word means. Now, this word inheritance, uh, or the idea of inheritance, is only Yisrael. Yisrael, scripturally. If people don't read their scriptures, they won't see this. But when they listen to the preachers at the pulpits, they're going to be hearing another, another message. It's about some, something else. There's a divided body, you know. But there's really only one body. And that body has always been Yisrael. In 1 Samuel 10, it says, And Shemuel took a flask of oil and poured it on his head and kissed him and said, It is not because Yahuwah has anointed, is it not? Is it not because Yahuwah has anointed you leader over his inheritance? Now, his inheritance, that's what Yisrael is. We are Yahuwah's possession. We are possessed, but we are also his property, his bride. A bride in that day was understood to be property. He, was, he owns us. He bought us. And we're his inheritance. In Yael, or Joel, chapter 3, it says, For look, in those days and at that time, when I turn back the captivity of Yehuda and Jerusalem, then I shall gather all the Gentiles and bring them down to the valley of Jehoshaphat. And I shall enter into judgment with them there for my people, my inheritance, Yisrael whom they have scattered among the Gentiles, and they have divided up my land. Now, it's interesting that these things have happened over the thousands of years, that we are in captivity. That's what he's referring to here. We're in captivity wherever we are, even if we're in the land right now, because he hasn't regathered us. But the United Nations did. The United Nations, or, well, let's back up. The Council on Foreign Relations, the CFR, which is actually a secret cartel, of international globalists, created the United Nations. That's what they did. And they did it with a thought in mind. The first act that they did was to, that they were to establish a homeland for the Yahudim in Israel. And they had a, an agenda for that because they were putting them right in the middle of all their enemies. But when Yahuwah gathers us, there will be no one. We will be able to lie, attacking us. We will be able to lie down and... Uh, and we'll be uh, safe forever. Now, the UN now sides with Israel's enemies um, and seek to divide the land up. In other words, if you go there and you ever see the United Nations flag, it's always standing next to a Palestinian flag. That's where they are. They're outside Israel on the land of Palestine. Yes, sir. In spite of the clandestine origin of the modern state of Israel, do you believe that it was God who was behind them doing. Oh, absolutely. In fact, um, everything that happens, whether we see it as good or bad, is actually good. You know, there's a lot, there was a little thing you shared with us by email about that. The man who said, that's good. Remember that email you sent me? Mm-hmm. Everything that happens can be turned to good. The, the cannibals that kidnapped the king... Uh, you know, didn't eat him because he had lost his thumb. And his servant, you remember the story, his servant was put in jail because he blew his thumb off. But in fact, you know, the king that lost his thumb wasn't eaten because he was missing the thumb. And then the man who was put in jail, uh, the king said, I'm so sorry I put you in jail for that because you saved my life. You blew my thumb off and they wouldn't eat me. And he said, oh, well, I'm glad you put me in jail because otherwise I would have been with you. You know, and then they would have both get, gotten eaten. Or not. The king would have had, still lost his thumb. But yeah. The secret is revealed to us. We are anointed by the Spirit of Yahushua in our vessels. In Colossians 1, starting at verse 26, it says, The secret which has been hidden from ages and from generations, but has now been revealed to his set-apart ones, to whom Elohim desired to make known what are the riches of the esteem of this secret among the Gentiles, which is Mashiach in you. The expectancy of esteem, whom we announce, 
warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom in order to present every man perfect in Messiah Yahushua, for which I also labor, striving according to the working of him who works in me in power. So that's interesting. See, Paul was possessed. <laughs> Paul was controlled, occupied, possessed by Yahushua. Are you? You know, wouldn't you like to be? Who is the son? You know, this is a big question. Everybody's swirling around and going, who is he? Well, Matthew or Matthew 11, verse 27 starts out saying, all have been handed over to me by my father. And no one knows the son except the father. Nor does anyone know the father except the son. And he to whom the son wishes to reveal him. I can't explain to you who the Son is. He's got to reveal it. And when he does, it's going to blow your mind. Proverbs 30, verse 4, asks the question, Who has gone up to the heavens and come down? Who has gathered the wind in his fists? Who has bound the waters in a garment? Who has established all the ends of the earth? What is his name? And what is his Son's name, if you know it? This riddle refers to what is called a shibboleth. Now, not many people know what a shibboleth is. I, I'm sorry to you know, have whipped on you two new words. Paracleta, that's the comforter, the intercessor. And that's the one that possesses you. <laughs> and the shibboleth. Now, the shibboleth, I'm, you're going to see more about that. Don't worry. The shibboleth is a code word. It's a... Uh, it's, you're going to see more about it as it develops. It involves his name and how you pronounce his name, too. It's interesting because people get all riled up about it, but there is something to this. Now, we're to test the spirits that we have. In 1 Yehukadon 4, 11 through, I mean 1 through 11, Beloved ones, do not believe every spirit, but prove the spirits, whether they are of Elohim, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. By this, you know the spirit of Elohim. Every spirit that confesses that Yahushua HaMashiach has come in the flesh is of Elohim. And every spirit that does not confess that Yahushua Mashiach has come in the flesh is not of Elohim. And this is the spirit of the anti-Messiah, which you heard is coming and now is already in the world. You are of Elohim, little children, and have overcome them because he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. Now, that's very important. We could just chew on that for a long time, but there's more. The one who loves knows Elohim. This is evidence of the spirit that's in the person. First Yehukanen 4, verse 5, They are of the world, therefore they speak as of the world, and the world hears them. We are of Elohim. The one knowing Elohim hears us. He who is not of Elohim does not hear us. By this we know the spirit of the truth and the spirit of the delusion. Beloved ones, let us love one another because love is of Elohim and everyone who loves has been born of Elohim and knows Elohim. The one who does not love does not know Elohim for Elohim is love. That's why we're married to him. See, when we're married to him, he possesses us as a bride and it's all about love. By this, the love of Elohim was manifested in us that Elohim has sent his only brought forth son into the world in order that we might live through him. In this is love, that we, not that we loved Elohim, but that he loved us and sent his son to be an atoning offering for our sins. Beloved ones, if Elohim so loved us, we ought also ought to love one another. Um, in one of the first parts of the scriptures, we see that the spirit of Elohim, the spirit, was moving upon the surface of the waters. And his presence is a mark of authenticity. That's what a shibboleth is. It's a mark of authenticity. And a mark can be a pronunciation of a word, either the absence of the word or the use of the word. If you do not use the name of Yahuwah, but you use devices, then the shibboleth will prove which one is of the true spirit of Elohim. The spirit of anti-Messiah 
is opposed to the name. Now, the identity of the spirit that searches the hearts and minds, his name is Yahusha. That's the spirit's name. Now, King Daoud was also possessed by the spirit of Yahuwah. In Psalm 51, starting at verse 10, it says, Create in me a clean heart, O Elohim, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence, your presence, and do not take your set-apart spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your deliverance and uphold me, noble spirit. Now, if we're guided by Yahushua's spirit, we automatically obey from the heart. Romans 6, 15 starts out saying, What then? Shall we sin because we're not under the Torah, but under favor? Let it not be. Do you not know that to whom you present yourselves servants for obedience? You're the servants of the one whom you obey, whether of sin to death or of obedience to righteousness. But thanks to Elohim that you were servants, that you were servants of sin. Yet you obeyed from the heart that form of teaching to which you were entrusted. And having been set free from sin, you became servants of righteousness. And we read the covenant and we see that it's good. Every one of them is good. So we're a called out assembly obeying from the heart. And if we obey from the heart, we have evidence that we have Yahushua's spirit in us. Who else would want to obey the commandments? Wouldn't you love to obey the commandments if you were able to do so? You can't in the flesh, though. We're going to read why we can't. But we can if we receive his spirit. We have to open the door, let him in. You know, like Paul McCartney sang in the song, open the door, let me in. Now, first, Yehuchanan 2, starting in verse 3, and by this we know that we love him if we guard his commands. The one who says, I know him and does not guard his commands is a liar and the truth is not in him. But whoever guards his word, the truly the love of Elohim has been perfected in him. By this we know that we are in him. The one who says he stays in him ought also to walk even as he walked. Acts 2, starting at verse 16. But this is what was spoken by the prophet Yael. And it shall be in the last days, says Elohim, that I shall pour out of my spirit on all flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. And your young men shall see visions. And your old men shall dream dreams. And also on my male servants and on my female servants, I shall pour out my spirit in those days and they shall prophesy and I shall show wonders in the heaven above and signs in the earth beneath blood and fire <coughs> and vapor of smoke the sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the coming of the great and splendid day of Yahuwah and it shall be that everyone who calls on the name of Yahuwah shall be saved the shibboleth the sign of authenticity the one who has the spirit of Yahusha will call upon the name of Yahuwah, the Shibboleth. It's a sign of authenticity. Um, remember the thing it, it, that happened in the, in the Tanakh where these men were testing the pronunciation of the word? That's uh, something you all can study. The tribe of Ephraim uh, lost a lot of men that day because they were... <laughs> Anyway, 2 Corinthians 4 says, And we have this treasure in earthen vessels, so that the excellence of the power might be of Elohim and not of us. Where does the power come from? The spirit of Yahushua, or the spirit of Yahuwah, because he's really the same, the same being. Our inner will must submit to the will of the spirit. We have to let him into our house. Matthew 26, or Matthew 26, at verse 39 says, And going forward a little, he fell on his face and prayed, saying, O oh my Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Yet not as I desire, but as you desire. Now that's the example. Acts 5.32 says, And we are his witnesses to these matters. And so also is the set-apart spirit, that's the Ruach HaKodesh, the Spirit of Messiah, whom Elohim has given to those who obey him. If you don't obey, you're not getting it. 
The one obeying the will of Yahuwah stands out clearly. Matthew 21 gives us an example of that, starting at verse 28. But what do you think? This is Yahusha speaking. A man had two sons, and he came to the first, and he said, Son, go work today in my vineyard. See, the world is our vineyard. And he answered, said, I do not wish to. But afterwards he repented and went. And having come to the second, the second son, he said similarly, and he answered, said, I'm going, master, but he did not go. Which of the two did the desire of the father? And they said to him, the first. Yehusha said to them, truly I say to you that tax collectors and whores are entering into the reign of Elohim before you. For Yehuchanan came to you in the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him. But tax collectors and whores believed him. And when you saw it, you did not repent afterwards to believe him. Those guarding the commandments walk in the spirit. The spirit of Yahusha enables us to obey. Romans 8, 1 through 4. There is then now no condemnation to those who are in Messiah Yahusha who do not walk according to the flesh. In other words, the mind of the flesh, the, the person's in charge on their throne instead of Yahusha. But according to the spirit, for the Torah of the spirit of the life of Messiah Yahusha has set me free from the law of sin and death. For the Torah being powerless in that it was weak through the flesh, Elohim having his own son in the likeness of flesh of sin and concerning sin condemns sin in the flesh so that the righteousness of the Torah should be completed in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. The flesh, however, is unable to obey without the spirit of Yahushua. Romans 8 continues, For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the matters of the flesh, but those who live according to the spirit, the matters of the spirit. For the mind of the flesh is death, but the mind of the spirit is life and peace, because the mind of the flesh is enmity, that means hatred, towards Elohim, for it does not subject itself to the Torah of Elohim. Neither indeed is it able. And those who are in the flesh are unable to please Elohim if you walk in the flesh. Romans 8, starting at verse 9 says, But you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if indeed the spirit of Elohim dwells in you. See, we're possessed. And if anyone does not have the spirit of Messiah, this one is not his. And if Messiah is in you, the body is truly dead on account of sin, but the spirit is life on account of righteousness. And if the spirit of him who raised Yahushua from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Messiah from the dead shall also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit in dwelling in you. So then, brothers, we are not debtors to the flesh to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you're going to die. But if the, but by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you shall live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of Elohim, these are sons of Elohim, including daughters too. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by which we cry out, Abba, Father. Now, we're led by the spirit of Yahushua, if we're his. And Yeshiyahu, or Isaiah 48, starting at 17, it says, Thus said Yahuwah, your Redeemer, the set-apart one of Yisrael, I am Yahuwah, your Elohim, teaching you what is best, leading you by the way you should go. If only you had listened to my commands, then your peace would have been like a river, and your righteousness like the waves of the sea. We are witnesses that Yahuwah is Elohim. In Yeshiyahu 43, at verse 10, it says, You are my witnesses, declares Yahuwah, and my servant whom I have chosen, so that you know and believe me and understand that I am he. Somebody's coming, in other words. And when you see him, you'll know who he is. That's what this Aleph Ta is doing down here. Before me there was no El formed, nor after me there is none. I, I am Yahuwah, and besides me there is no deliverer. What is that saying to you? Who is he? 
I, I have declared and saved and made known. And there was no foreign mighty one among you. And you are my witnesses, declares Yahuwah, that I am Elohim, or El. The Greek word for helper, advocate, comforter, intercessor is paraclete, from parakleta in Aramaic. And Yehuchanan 14, starting at verse 26, it says, But the helper, the set-apart spirit, whom the Father shall send in my name, he shall teach you all and remind you of all that I said to you. Peace I li leave with you, my peace I give to you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. You heard that I said to you, I am going away and I am coming to you. So who's coming? He is. So the name of the Spirit is Yahusha. It's his identity. Not Serim choose to obey and receive the Ruach HaKodesh. Now Ruach means wind or spirit. And HaKodesh means the set apart. The set apart spirit. Acts 5, chapter 5, starting at verse 30 says, The Elohim of our fathers raised up Yahusha, whom you laid hands on, hanging him on a timber, him, a prince and savior. Elohim has exalted to his right hand to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And we are his witnesses to these matters. And so also is the set apart spirit whom Elohim has given to those who obey him. Now, that's an interesting thing. A lot of people uh, wonder, what was he meaning? Uh, those who say that, well, I'll, I'll read it to you. Uh, in First Yahukanan chapter 4, it says, Beloved ones, do not believe every spirit, but prove the spirits, whether they are of Elohim, because many false prophets have gone out into the world, and by this you know the spirit of Elohim. Every spirit that confesses that Yahusha HaMashiach has come in the flesh is of Elohim, and every spirit that does not confess <coughs> that Yahusha HaMashiach has come in the flesh is not of Elohim. And this is the spirit of the anti-Messiah which you heard is coming and now is already in the world. Well, this was an early form of Gnosticism. See, Gnosticism was a growing thing. It was a, 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 they taught many other little nuances, but one of their primary problems was they considered all flesh to be evil, and they thought everything spiritual was good and uh, they had a lot of other doctrines but that was a fundamental one and it was something that was being taught at Colossae uh, you know this city that's in Turkey anyway it originated in Colossae which was a city that Shaul or Paul was writing to and he was trying to overcome this in his letter um, Gnosticism promoted that secret knowledge was necessary for eternal life, and it was even superior to faith. Gnostics believed all flesh to be evil. Therefore, to them, Yahushua did not come in the flesh. So that he wouldn't have been perfect if he had done that. You know? But he, he was completely human. And Paul's letter to the Colossians was primarily sent to destroy that stronghold, that belief, that false reasoning, false reasoning of Gnosticism. If we love one another, we know Yahusha is in us. First Yehuchanan 4 says, Beloved ones, if Elohim so loved us, we ought also to love one another. No one has seen Elohim at any time. If we love one another, Elohim does stay in us, and his love has been perfected in us. By this we know that we stay in him, and he in us because he has given us of his spirit. See what love the Father has given us, that we should be called the children of Elohim. For this reason the world does not know us, because it did not know him. Beloved ones, now we are the children of Elohim, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be. But we, sh but we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. See, he's our, our husband. He's our bridegroom. And I am my beloved's, and my beloved is mine. See, we're united with him. If you have been immersed calling on his name, then you are his. You gave yourself to him and the covenant and promised to obey him. 
Nazarim strive to restore Yisrael into one body. That's what our main objective is. If we have the indwelling of the spirit of Messiah, our objectives are his objectives. Yirmiyahu 31, starting at verse 31, says, See, the days are coming, declares Yehua, when I shall make a renewed covenant, or a new covenant, with the house of Yisrael and with the house of Yehuda. This is the, the scattered tribes and the Yahudim, you know. Not like the covenant I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Mitzrayim, my covenant which they broke, though I was a husband to them, declares Yahuwah, for this is the covenant I shall make with the house of Yisrael. There's only going to be one house at that point. After those days, declares Yahuwah, I shall put my Torah in their inward parts and write it on their hearts, and I shall be their Elohim and they shall be my people. And you can read Ezekiel chapter 37, verse 15 through 17. And that's the, enabled by the spirit of Yahushua indwelling us. That's what that's referring to. That's the new covenant, as the Christians want to refer to it. Deuteronomy 4 is describing the scattering of us. At verse 27, we start reading, And Yahuwah shall scatter you among the peoples, and you shall be left few in number among the Gentiles, where Yahuwah drives you, the prodigal son. And there you shall serve mighty ones, the work of men's hands, wood and stone, which neither see nor hear nor eat nor, nor smell. But from there you shall seek Yahuwah your Elohim, and shall find, when you search for him with all your heart and with all your being, in your distress, when all these words shall come upon you in the latter days, then you shall return to Yahuwah your Elohim and shall obey his voice. It doesn't say you'll go, go anywhere. It says you shall return to Yahuwah. You know, not the land. He'll do that. For Yahuwah your Elohim is a compassionate El. He does not forsake you nor destroy you, nor forget the covenant of your fathers which he swore to them. Now, out of his inheritance, there is a treasured possession. His inheritance is the broad nation of priests, Yisrael. All of the tribes are priests, of, uh, according to the order of Melchizedek. Adam was the first priest of Melchizedek. And then, uh, subsequently, the order of Melchizedek, it maintained, but it was sort of forgotten about for a while, too. But... Uh, Anyway, the thing of it is, this treasured possession is, is mentioned in Malachi. And it's obviously the Nazarim who are doing this in the last days. If you read Yirmiyahu 31, verse 6, it says that the Nazarim would rise up on the hills of Ephraim and say, let us return. You know, Then those who fear Yahuwah speak to one another, and Yahuwah listen and hear in a book of remembrance be written before him of those who fear Yahuwah and those who think upon his name. The Shibboleth. That's the Shibboleth. The one who thinks upon his name. And they shall be mine, said Yahuwah of hosts, on the day that I prepare a treasured possession. That word possession keeps popping up. Only this is a treasured possession. This is a separate group of people. These are the wise virgins the wise managers that are t feeding the household. And I shall spare them as a man spares his own son who serves him. Then you shall again see the difference between the righteous and the wrong, between the one who serves Elohim and the one who does not serve him. What is the sign of authenticity? What is the shibboleth? That's what a shibboleth is. The sign of authenticity is they call upon his name. Ya, the prophet Yael said it. It was quoted in Acts chapter 2. We read it. The one that you obey is the one that you serve. And you need to know your husband's name. Or he'll, you can knock and, let me in, let me in. He'll say, I didn't know you. You don't even know your husband's name? How can that be? Anyway, you'll make the distinction. See, that's what a shibboleth's function is. It's, to, it's a sign of authenticity. The way that you'll be able to determine one from the other. You know, the one who serves Elohim and the one who does not serve him. Romans 6, starting at verse 15. What then? 
Shall we sin because we're not under Torah, but under favor? Let it not be. See, he's saying it. Your servants are the one whom you obey. And you need to know what his name is, and you need to know what his will is, as well as the commandments. Now, here's an objective that a lot of people may have seen in the scriptures, and it's not well understood. In 1 Corinthians 12, it says that this same spirit, it keeps popping up over and over in this text. It says same spirit. It's not two, it's not three, it's one. And there, there are, are different kinds of gifts, but the same spirit. There are different kinds of services, but the same master. And there are different kinds of workings, but it is the same Elohim who is working all in all. And to each is given the manifestation of the spirit for profiting. For to one is given a word of wisdom through the spirit, and to another a word of knowledge according to the same spirit, and to another belief by the same spirit, and to other another gifts of healing by the same spirit, and to another operations of powers, and to another prophecy, and to another discerning of spirits, and to another kinds of tongues, diverse kinds of tongues, and to another interpretation of tongues. But one and the same spirit works all these, distributing to each individually as he intends. Now the ultimate goal is that Yahuwah fills all his creation. In Ephesians 1.22 it says, And he put all under his feet and gave him to be head over all to the assembly which is his body, the completeness of him who fills all in all. 1 Corinthians 15 at verse 28 says, And when all were made subject to him, then the Son himself shall also be subject to him who put all under him in order that Elohim be all in all. The counselor is present in his body. That's the paracleta. That's the presence of our, of our comforter, you know, our helper. Yeshayahu 9 verse 6 and 7 says, For a child shall be born to us, a son shall be given unto us, and the rule is on his shoulder. And his name is called Wonder, Counselor, Strong L, Father of Continuity, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his rule and peace, there is no end. Upon the throne of Daud and over his reign, to establish it and sustain it with right ruling and with righteousness from now on, even forever, the ardor of Yahuwah of hosts does this. Now that word hosts is Saba, which means an army. So we're in combat. That's what we are. And we're part of that. We're uh, under his authority. Our behavior, how we act in the world and speak, and the things that we do, obeying his commandments and teaching his commandments and loving one another, exhibits to everyone that we belong to Yahusha. We're his possession. And we are literally possessed by him. In Yahukadon, or John 13, 34, 35, it says, A renewed command I give to you that you love one another, as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this shall all know that you are my taught ones, if you have love for one another. Now, what is Yahusha doing right now? That's an interesting question. A lot of people wonder about that. He is omnipresent, you know. He's also omnitemporal and omniscient and omnipotent. He's indwelling his people. He's molding our desires. He's enabling obedience, directing his body, using his vessels to spread the invitation to the wedding feast. The wedding feast is right before us. The sign of uh, the, his coming is, is all around us. I mean, the violence from the days of Noah, everything. He's in control. We're not, so we don't have to worry. He can be seen in his bride. His body expresses his behavior and his character. Now, here's an interesting thing, too, that the fruits of the Spirit, the Spirit's presence, at Galatians 5, starting at verse 22, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, 
peace, patience, kindness, goodness, trustworthiness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no Torah. And those who are of Messiah have impaled the flesh with its passions and its desires. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. You ever see that happening in the Nazarene? A little bit? By their fruits you shall know them. If Yahushua is running their, 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 their uh, body, their house, and their mouth, and they're typing, you'll know they're known by the fruits. There's the fruits. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, and so forth. Gentleness. Now, there is no distinguishing, there, no, there is a distinguishing feature. That's what I've been saying, this word shibboleth, shibboleth, all, over, all through this whole thing. The distinguishing feature is the shibboleth. And it's among those who have Yahushua's spirit in them. It's a sign of authenticity. The spirit's fruit, the outer manifestation and behavior is the fruit, but the shibboleth must also be there, the sign of authenticity. Now, in Zechariah 4, verses 3 through 6, we see a description of something that involves two olive trees. And these are explained in the, in the same text as being sons of light. Only the word light is oil. They're two sons of oil. The oil is not the, the physical thing. It's the figurative thing. The oil is light. And uh, the two olive trees are these sons of oil. Now, it says, and two olive trees are by it. It's a menorah. It's by this menorah. He sees this big golden menorah seven lampstands, one at the right of the bowl and the other at its left. Then I responded and spoke to the messenger who was speaking to me, saying, What are these, my master? And the mes messenger who was speaking to me answered and said to me, Do you not know what these are? And I said, No, my master. And he answered and said to me, This is the word of Yahuwah to Zerubbabel, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit said Yahuwah of armies. Yahuwah of armies. Now, if you read Romans 9, our vessels relate to this. Our vessels are chosen by Yahuwah for his use. We're either vessels of honor or we are vessels to be destroyed. Shibboleth, that, that's the word, the sign of authenticity. It's a word of authent authentication for identification of a particular class or group. And we're not to be envying one another or being conceited. We are just stating the truth, the truth. And the shibboleth is his name. It's the way, and we, he will not give us his name if we are not going to obey him. He won't do it. This is a picture over here of the, of the menorah and the two olive trees, you know. And then there's a, connecting the uh, channel. So we're to love one another and we're to go and teach. And he said, I am with you always because his spirit is in us. And Yahushua is his name. And we're always saying, Baruch Habab Bashem Yahuwah. Blessed <coughs> is the one who comes in the name of Yahuwah, the Shibboleth. That's the sign of authenticity. Now here's our commission. He gave it to us at the very end. This is the message that we've got to get out. Matthew 28, Therefore go and make taught ones of all the nations, immersing them in the name of the Father, there's the name, and the Son and the Ruach, and the Ruach HaKadosh, teaching them to guard all that I have commanded you. And see, I am with you always, until the end of the age. Amen. <laughs>